Wonderful. Welcome, everybody. It's lovely to see such a large audience. And um, I'm sorry we're starting a little late. Uh, we have been bumped, of course, by the male panel. But today we're going to be talking about girls and girls' education. And I've got a fantastic expert panel for you um, here to discuss their important work. Uh, Deval Barthia, on my right. Um, Manira Su, uh, Ifisu, Isifu, sorry. Uh, in front of me, Arman Rapatalu uh, uh, on, on my left, and Denise Carrera here on my left too. And Denise will be talking uh, in Portuguese, so this is why you've got your headsets to uh, listen when you need to. Um, and colleagues are going to be sharing the work that they are doing addressing girls' education in their different contexts on the ground and sharing their learning with us. Um, I'm going to ask them, first of all, to spend a minute introducing themselves and their work, and then we'll get to the business of learning. So, Dawal, starting with you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dawal from India, and uh, I run this program called Mission One Million Girls, which is now active in India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and we have just begun operations in Uganda. And we have been lucky that we have been featured in the Guinness Book of World Record for teaching the maximum girls at a single venue. So that was something that gave a lot of impetus to the work that we have done. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Munira Tuisifu, as mentioned earlier. I work with the Vaki Foundation. And in Ghana, we run an interactive distance learning program. It's a program that seeks to improve the learning outcomes of girls, mainly in literacy and numeracy. And we also run life skills and role model sessions for the girls using the same interactive um, tech system. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and salam alaikum everyone. I'm Rahmatullah Arman. I have about five years of experience in teaching within the schools and about three years in teaching in universities. Currently, I'm a Malala Fan Gulmakai champion. I'm also CEO and founder of Teach for Afghanistan organization. It's an organization working for providing quality education to Afghan children, both girls and boys. And uh, it's through empowering young Afghan men and women so that we are developing their collective leadership to achieve quality education for all of our children. Thank you. Eu sou Denise Carreira. Quero agradecer a oportunidade de estar aqui, agradecer ao, ao Fundo Malala, ao Fundo Malala, à Fundação VARC, agradecer também por participar da rede Gulmacai, que reúne ativistas pelo direito à educação, pessoas que têm feito uma luta muito importante em vários lugares do mundo. Eu me defino como uma educadora popular brasileira, uma educadora feminista latino-americana, que entende a educação, que defende a educação como um direito humano, e não como uma mercadoria, não como um favor, não como uma caridade. Então, estou muito feliz de estar aqui. Thank you so much. So we'll really open the discussion by uh, asking colleagues to just share a little bit about their learning. And towards the end of the session, I do intend to draw the audience in as well. So you'll get the chance to ask more questions too. Um, so first of all, if I can start with you, Darvel, what, what, what learning can you share about your work in the area of girls' education? And perhaps if you can just say a little about challenges you faced as well? Yeah, thank you so much. So I will tell you in the context of India, what the government has done is something very beautiful. We have a Right to Education Act, which makes it compulsory and free for every child to go to school. I think our friend Amrish is doing good work in association with the Malala Fund. And so girls are in school, and also as an incentive, the government gives free food to every girl child who comes to school. So if not for education, at least for the sake of food, they believe the parent will send the girl to the school and get some education. On the challenging front, what we have realized is that although we have created equity in terms of attendance, there are a lot of perceptional challenges. Like there was a case I would like to share with you in one school, uh, the cleaning staff went on a holiday. So there was no one to do the brushing and the mopping and the housekeeping. So the principal comes to the class and says, all the girls please come out. The boys can stay back. And girls please help us in doing all these chores. Mm because she believed that these were fe feminine things and boys were not supposed to do that. And so the girls were asked to do the, meeping, uh, the mopping and the washing, which, which, I, which I felt was a little bit derogatory. And in another instance I would like to share with you is that there were certain schools where they are deprived of infrastructure. 
So there are very few equipments in the laboratory, or they sometimes run out of computers. So they say, okay, the boys, you will get the equipments mm. to do the experiments. Girls can just observe them. Right. Because anyways, chemistry, physics is not for girls. You know, the perception yeah. is like that. Yeah. So uh, the, the guys will sit on the computers, and the girls will just observe them. So these are perceptional challenges that we have to encounter. So a major challenge is confronting stereotyping, basically, in the teachers as well as in students and their parents. Because we are a patriarchal society in, in most countries, so uh, yeah, that is yeah, what we have to Yeah, it's not something that we all should share, and uh, contesting stereotypes is something that faces us all, I'm sure. Mani Ratsu, say a little about your context. Yes. So in, in Ghana, one key thing that we have learned in, um, in the process of implementation is that the girl doesn't live in a vacuum. So if you want to really support the girl, you would have to look at the various, um, the, the context in which the girl is found. The girl lives within the community, so the community needs to be involved. The girl sits in the classroom. You can't tackle girls' issues without tackling um, issues surrounding teachers and then the way the teachers teach their own stereotypes and then how it impacts on the girl in the classroom. And then also you need to look at the school leadership you need to even look at the staff of the Ghana Education Service who have the mandate of providing education for the girls. And more importantly also, you need to look at the boys as well. Because I think we realize along implementation that it is very important to, to consider boys as well mm -hmm. if you're tackling girls' issues. Otherwise, it becomes um, a one-sided. You lose that balance and you're very unli unlikely to, to achieve um, what you set out to do. One major challenge that we have had have also got to do with um, stereotypes, I think. With, um, and, and that really cuts across. So trying to really get um, to deal with this has been a major challenge for us. And one other thing also has been um, we run a life skills project for the girls. So after school, they, say, they stay back. We bring in role models um, to share experiences with them. And then throughout this process, we also concentrate on topics such as uh, building self-confidence, self-esteem. And then what we realized was that the, the, we had some consequences, some of which we did not really intend or we didn't plan for. For instance, we had girls really um, becoming more responsible and more responsive to things at home. But in doing that, we realized that some of them would tell you, some of their parents would share with us and say, okay, now our girls are behaving very responsibly and they take up all the household chores in the house. <laughs> but that wasn't really what we intended to. We really want them to be able to, the boys to be more supportive and then to be able to share roles. So we had to come up with strategies to deal with this as well. Really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. So again, this theme of stereotyping. Yes. Um, but I'm going to come back to you later, Manu, up to okay. boys as well. We'll just come back to boys. Armin. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, when looking at Afghanistan, so obviously we, looked, we have to look at the history of Afghanistan. So recently, like due to these four decades of war, so there have been tremendous challenges in Afghanistan, lots of problems in Afghanistan. And even at a time, in Afghanistan, whole girls' education was banned. So no girl was inside schools. I mean, they just stopped and no, they couldn't be inside the schools. Beside that, so teachers and women, they couldn't work, even they couldn't go out. So that itself remained a huge kind of effect on the mindset of the societies, on the communities, and people's mindset and all. Although there has been tremendous achievements since the last 18 years, but still we have like in Afghanistan, like two thirds of the girls are out of school. Beside that, like the challenges of like obviously due to the social norms and cultures that they, fail, that they face. The one specific challenge that within Chief of Afghanistan, me, myself, that I faced, and with the learning I wanted to share that, is uh, we, re need, we knew the importance of including the communities in our work, engaging them in the work, so that we have the community support, so that they support us in our initiative, so that we ensure that girls receiving quality education, the communities themselves. We, we actually organized some gatherings and we organized several meetings with them and all. But soon we realized that that's not enough actually. That's like when you are addressing such a huge, big problem and huge of years and decades, then it's not just going to get solved with some meetings and gatherings and all. So the learning we had was like obviously we needed champions inside each community, champions inside each community to, to raise their voice for God's education, to support us in that regard. And that's what, like, within Teach for Afghanistan, we are having that focus on. 
like we develop the collective leadership. We want like leaders, champions, raising their voice for girls in, from every sec sector and from every communities. And uh, I'm just sharing a very small story of a very successful story that we had regarding this. In a very far district in Nangarhar province, we were facing challenges with the communities who are not really very happy with our female teacher going to that school. So there were some barriers. Sometimes they would discuss us, why is she coming? She's not from here, and also different, different things. And then sometimes they would come and they would say, like, she's encouraging the girls to speak and go and gatherings. She's organizing different kind of things. So lots of these such challenges. Mm -hmm. So what we did was with the engagement within the community, so the girl, the fellow of Teach for Afghanistan, who was very much qualified, she, were ab she was able to convince the community elders to become member of the school shoras or school committees. Right. It was, she faced several challenges and all, but through the parents of the children, she could convince her. So once they were in that community, so they could really understand that, no, she's not for a bad reason here. She is for a good reason. But still, the same thing that I was just mentioning, like having champions among them. Mm. So once the fellow of Teacher of Afghanistan, Shamsia, when she completed the fellowship, after the complete two years, so she participated in a very small kind of election within the same community leadership. And she became the very first lady, very first woman, being elected, it's not like about the policy of government, but she was elected as a member of the community members. And now she is doing all what is in her hands and her powers so that she's ensuring that we have complete support from there. So that was a learning that we need champions mm. within communities, within sectors, so that to help us reach our goal. Fantastic, thank you. So again, there's something about uh, the community, which is a, the wider community, which is a theme that's been coming through and about these key brokers uh, that have a really important role to play. And Denise? I already identifico aqui various points. I identifico aqui já various points in common in what se refere à necessity da education dos meninos, de construção de alianças nas comunidades. O nosso trabalho que nós desenvolvemos, ele tem no Brasil duas frentes. Uma frente que é defender a agenda da igualdade de gênero e raça nas escolas, que vem sendo atacada não só no Brasil, mas em outros países da América Latina, vem sendo é... então a importância, então, é... o nosso trabalho no Brasil tem duas frentes, uma frente que é defender as escolas e as professoras que vêm abordando as questões de gênero e raça nas escolas. É, nós temos vivido no Brasil um contexto de crescimento da atuação de grupos ultra conservadores que tem proibido esse debate, tem estimulado a perseguição e as ameaças a professoras, a estudantes que debatam gênero e, e as questões raciais na escola. Então, uma dimensão do nosso trabalho é a construção de estratégias políticas, jurídicas, de manuais, para que as escolas consigam se defender contra essa onda conservadora. Uma outra dimensão, então, uma primeira dimensão é da defesa da, contra esses ataques. Uma segunda dimensão do nosso trabalho é de promover o debate, promover a discussão sobre gênero e raça como parte da construção do que a gente chama qualidade na educação pública. Para isso, nós temos um conjunto de metodologias participativas que buscam envolver as meninas, mas não só elas, os meninos e as famílias e as professoras nessa discussão formativa sobre o que é gênero e raça na educação. Uma aprendizagem muito importante para nós, uma, uma aprendizagem muito especial, se refere à importância de estimular que as professoras e professores reflitam sobre sua trajetória de vida, reflitam de que forma as questões de gênero e raça impactaram a sua construção como pessoas e como educadores. Nós entendemos que para que um educador para que uma educadora se transforme num sujeito de transformação e possa, de fato, promover equidade de gênero e raça, ela precisa também se apropriar da sua própria história de vida na perspectiva de transformá-la. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, that's, that's been really interesting, and it's fantastic that some common, clear themes are coming through very much. And at the end there, of course, we had the theme of political context and the grave challenges being faced by educators in Brazil at the moment. Um, but I'm sure that there are um, challenges of context, we heard a little bit from Armand as well, um, about uh, the issues around culture, expectations, um, the political context and so on. So perhaps my next question I think would be very much um, around context. Are there principles that we should always try to adhere to in educating for gender equity, um, or must we um, inflect, um, you know, to deal with uh, uh, local cultures and so forth? Um, perhaps I could start with you, Aman, on, on, on that. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I really truly believe, like, every child has the potential to learn. So. The cultures, obviously, that we can develop is like, uh, like looking at the challenges, looking at the problems. So obviously, that cannot have a single sh solution for that. And uh, some like specific to context, as you just mentioned, like so Afghanistan, obviously from India, from uh, Ghana, from Brazil, it's a very very different context. The context that I just mentioned, but due to like suffering from several decades of war and the challenges that all we have. So in a context of Afghanistan, so obviously it's like about the challenge all about more about illiteracy, the school dropouts, the very high level number of like teachers dropouts and shortages, and a high level of teacher uh, students ratios and all. So overall, so if you can, can uh, again, yes. Was well, how far should we care about context and, and, and how? How far are there certain principles that we must hold on to, or how much do, should we uh, be willing to change for our context? Thank you very much. I believe like uh, it should be a collective, a, a collective action. So we need to include all of them, like not just communities, but at the same time, like one of the best learning that teacher of Afghanistan, the teacher of Afghanistan we had was like it's like including like the children, the learners themselves, the parents, the communities. At the same time, obviously the government as well. So it should be a continuous effort, a collective effort, so that we make sure that obviously we are achieving a, a, a greater goals in that regard as well. Thank you. So influencing is the key here. Very much. And Maniratsu, do you have something to add there? Yeah, I think in, in the context in which we work, um, we found that role modeling is very important, which is also very much related to influencing. So what we realize is that we work with very deprived um, schools and communities. So what we have done is to set up studios in the capital city and then bring in teachers who are very well trained to teach and then that is broadcasted to schools that are very far away and very deprived. So students who would otherwise, or school children who otherwise would not have um, teachers in the classroom or qualified teachers in the classroom are able to have access to a teacher though from a distance. And then we realize that um, in most of those communities, teachers, especially female teachers, would normally not accept postings to those areas. So what we did was to actually look out for female teachers deliberately to train them to do these broadcast lessons for the students to realize that, okay, it's possible for even females to become teachers. And then what we did also is, um, what we have been doing is to bring in role models. So these role models are women who have excelled in various areas. They could even be community members who have excelled and recognized in the community. So they come into the studios and then share their experiences with these girls. And then we found that very effective because um, with just one role model in the studio, we're able to reach out to thousands of students at a go, which wouldn't be possible if you wanted to move around to these schools with the role models. So the power of technology has really helped us. And in this process, even though we started, as I mentioned earlier, focusing on girls, we realized that the boys felt very left out and it was becoming very challenging for us. So we included the boys also. So we now have um, female clubs, we have boys clubs as well, but we also have mixed sessions where we bring both boys and girls together to discuss issues. Mm -hmm. so that is the kind of context in which um, we are delivering our projects. Thank you so much. And Denise, could é, nós vivemos no Brasil um contexto é, que articula a ação desses grupos ultraconservadores com ultraliberais. 
E esses grupos têm atacado também o financiamento das políticas sociais e levaram ao corte do financiamento da educação e viabilizando o nosso Plano Nacional de Educação. O desafio de lidar com esse contexto, que impõe uma, uma carga, uma responsabilidade muito maior para meninas e mulheres, é de construir e ampliar alianças políticas. Então, o nosso desafio é de ampliar essas alianças políticas, tornando mais evidente para a sociedade por que é importante abordar gênero e raça na educação. É, o gênero e raça não é importante só para as meninas, mas para o conjunto da sociedade. É importante para que também possamos enfrentar, no caso do Brasil, uma realidade marcada por uma violência é, doméstica gigante. O Brasil é um dos recordistas mundiais de violência contra meninas e mulheres. Então, abordar gênero é, é algo fundamental para que a gente consiga enfrentar essa realidade é, de tanta violência. Gênero também tem a ver com as escolhas é, políticas é, econômicas que o país faz. Gênero tem a ver com o modelo de desenvolvimento. Gênero tem a ver com a destruição das nossas florestas. Então, mostrar que abordar gênero é algo que significa abordar o próprio uh, o modelo de desenvolvimento e, a, e os desafios de uma sociedade que, eh, que enfrenta ataques à sua democracia. Né? Nós trabalhamos geralmente em três dimensões. Então, investindo nessa construção de alianças, mas buscando atuar em três dimensões. Uma dimensão é o cotidiano, então aqui e agora, o dia a dia das pessoas, que, que mudanças nós podemos gerar no aqui e agora. Uma outra dimensão da transformação é institucional, então pensar a escola como uma instituição que pode reproduzir, mas pode transformar essas relações. E o outro terceiro nível são as políticas públicas, para que a gente trabalhe, a gente que trabalha com uma perspectiva de direito à educação, de direito humano à educação, para que a gente consiga ter escala a gente precisa de políticas públicas, a gente precisa de Estado, a gente precisa de financiamento educacional. Então, nosso trabalho busca construir alianças abordando essa totalidade do desafio da transformação e da promoção da equidade de gênero e raça na educação. Obrigado, Andalvo. Então, no contexto, o que eu percebi é que Although political will is very easy to change, there are societal norms and cultural norms which are very difficult to influence because they've been carried on for centuries and even generations. Like in many cultures we have seen, girls get married at a very early age, by the age of 17, 18, 19. So we have a lot of girls in primary school, very few in secondary, and very, very few in tertiary school. And uh, these norms have been carried on for so long that people are absolutely right about it. Now I can initiate change if there is some gap but I cannot change anyone who believes that is absolutely right about what he's doing. So we have seen a high dropout rate in many of the countries as the age progresses. And uh, my friend was telling me from Malaysia, it's exactly the opposite. That they have a reservation system, 70% uh, seats are reserved in tertiary education for girls. And only 30% seats are reserved for the boys. So I think we have to see an independent context. But the baseline should be clear. We all want to achieve equity. Mm, thank you for that. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because um, clearly these di uh, different cultural norms and the stereotypes that we've talked about um, have very different uh, influences in relation to context and in relation to, for example, different minority ethnic groups or uh, different national, na uh, national contexts as well. Um, I've been very aware from my own work that um, different groups of students, for example, even a British context, um, have quite different aspirations depending on ethnicity. Um, typically in my own research, um, young people, uh, women from um, Asian and East Asian backgrounds had uh, higher STEM aspirations, for example, uh, than the white British majority. So we see these complexities coming into play all the time. And I suppose that this is where we get into the business of intersectionality and the importance of thinking about which girls and which boys and how uh, different facets of identity also intersect, whether that's ethnicity, uh, social class, disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, and gender. And Muniratsu, you have brought us back to boys several times. 
Um, of course, we mustn't forget the education, particularly of uh, boys from socially disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, Darvel, you mentioned uh, the point about also influencing boys and men to better support girls and women and support their education. So perhaps I can ask our panellists a little bit about educating boys and what that looks like in a progressive way. Perhaps we can start with you, Denise. A educação, então, primeiro eu gostaria de destacar isso que você falou agora sobre a importância de reconhecer as diferenças e as desigualdades entre as meninas em seus diferentes contextos. No nosso país, por exemplo, é, nós temos que reconhecer as, as desigualdades que permeiam as mulheres e as diferenças que estão colocadas. Então, também esse é um desafio dos trabalhos educativos na escola. Né, de reconhecer, potencializar aquela diferença que traz agência, traz força, e encarar e buscar enfrentar aquilo que é barreira, que é desigualdade. Sobre o trabalho com os meninos, esse é um trabalho fundamental, porque não se trata só de estimular uma educação das meninas para que elas se adaptem ao mundo masculino. É, é fundamental a gente trabalhar a relação entre meninos e meninas no sentido também que os meninos valorizem tudo aquilo que foi considerado como algo do mundo feminino, sobretudo o chamado mundo do cuidado. Isso passa desde a divisão do trabalho doméstico, ao cuidado das crianças, ao cuidado com os idosos, a uma outra relação com a natureza. É, o modelo é, de masculinidade hegemônica no meu país, como em vários lugares do mundo, é algo opressivo para a maior parte dos meninos. Então, é importante evidenciar por que abordar gênero é algo fundamental também, importante e transformador para os meninos. E, e não só estimular que as meninas entrem na área de ciências, tecnologias, em outras áreas ainda dominadas por por homens, mas que também os meninos possam valorizar a cultura do cuidado e tudo aquilo que foi sempre considerado como algo das mulheres. Excelente, thank you. Uh, you know what I have observed is that most of the girls are out of school, maybe because of circumstance, but often boys are out of school out of choice, because once they reach teenage, there are so many distractions, there are so many other things that they want to do that education becomes a, a, a second priority. And often we have seen that uh, because of financial reason, the family depends on the boy to earn. They want him to be the bread earning member of the family. So they want him to be a help in the agricultural work or do some kind of a trade or some kind of a job that will support the family. So yes, we need to focus a lot on boys' education also. Only then can we achieve equity and parity that we are talking about. Because only if we focus on the girls, then we'll have a lopsided growth. So yeah, circumstantial changes for the girls and more of impetus changes for the boys is what we require. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, in Ghana, at the lower primary level, we tend to, um, we have been able to achieve some form of um, gender parity. It is when you begin moving up to the higher levels of education, then the number of girls starts reducing drastically. So what, what we have been um, looking at is how do we really sustain the girls, how do we promote transition such that they, in terms of access, they have it, but how do we ensure that they're able to move to the higher levels? Because a lot of them drop out, sometimes due to um, a number of challenges. And I think quite the opposite thing happens in Ghana. In Ghana, it's rather, it's rather the females that um, families will rely upon to support in terms of income generating. So when they get to um, primary five, six, where they are old enough to be able to generate income for their parents, they tend to drop out of school to work to support their families. So it is at that level that you really need to focus on. And some of them also end up getting pregnant and drop out. Right now, we don't have um, a very clear return to school policy, even though there's been a lot of verbal discussion on it, but we don't have a clear policy that allows um, young mothers to be able to come back to school to study. So you realize that head teachers or school leaders tend to make their decisions. So they decide sometimes, okay, we'll accept these people back. And sometimes they will decide and say no. When they come into the school, they become bad influence. 
to the school because the students will feel, okay, it's okay to get pregnant and then you're able to return to school. So that becomes a challenge. And sometimes for stigma and all that, they tend to move out into other communities to continue schooling. And if you don't have the resources to support you, it becomes a problem. And for some of them also, those that drop, even um, people to support, take care of their babies to enable them to come back to school is a challenge. So when we started our after school session, what we did was we allowed them, the young mothers to come to our sessions with their babies so that that makes it, they feel more comfortable to come and then sit in class with their babies. And, and um, the other thing also that I think um, we also need to look at in terms of our context is the kind of um, lip service that we pay to most of these things. We have all these policies, but sometimes on the ground, they really, we don't implement them to the latter. In Ghana, the unit that is really in charge of um, girls' education is a very marginalized unit. Yeah. It's a unit that do yeah. not even have the resources. So most often they tend to rely on support from NGOs to do their work. So it's almost like NGOs driving their agenda rather than the way around, mm -hmm. the way, um, the, rather than the other way around. So that is also a big challenge that we try to deal with. Thank yeah. you very much. So again, there's an issues around practical support for girls and obviously pregnant uh, women is, is an important issue for you've raised there and also issues about sort of symbolism and some of the work having to be ground up yes. and owned by the local community as well. Armin, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I strongly believe that equal opportunities should be provided even when you're talking about girls education or boys education, so equal education opportunities mm. should be provided. And uh, like it can start from the classrooms itself, like how a teacher treats both girls and boys students like equally, how resources and opportunities are equally provided to both of them. From there, they, they both boys and girls, they understand how to respect each other's rights. Obviously, it goes side by side. And from the family, the same thing. But at the same time, being a feminist, so I'm very much against the idea of uh, like only educating girls or boys specific to respect others' rights, like specifically sometimes we discuss about like educating boys to respect girls' equality, you to believe in equality that, okay, girls should be also given equal rights. I mean, here again, then we will be also again giving a superior role to the boys because they should be educated so that they can give or they can allow us to provide them an equal education. So it, I think it should go very much side by side. Mm -hmm. Both girls and boys should be educated equally, and both should be able, I mean, if, even if you're talking about the respect, equality and all, so both should understand, both should be educated to give or support equal opportunities for each other. That's really helpful, and I think both you and Denise have drawn out very strongly some of the challenges for boys and young men around uh, dominant constructions of masculinity and how that can be very challenging for them on a personal level. So the benefits uh, for boys uh, being educated about equality that you know, enables uh, sort of freer constructions of gender for both girls and boys. I think this uh, challenge to kind of battle against yeah. stereotypes for both boys and girls has come through very strongly from the panel. But we must uh, let the audience have a say as well. Um, this is slightly challenging with our sort of circular arrangement, so forgive me if I can't see uh, hands going up, but um, perhaps if I can take um, a collection of a couple of uh, questions each time. Do the audience have questions for our panel? You might have to help me. There. We've got a lady here at the front. Any others? Let's start with you then. I'm Jyotsna from India. Uh, so one question for uh, Dennis and uh, Muni, Muni, Munira, Munirata, and perhaps also Aman. Uh, you know, when we say equal, that, that becomes very difficult when you are actually in a classroom, especially when classrooms happen to be very complex. And researchers on boys, especially adolescents across the world, actually, tells you that issues of even boys' underachievements are actually uh, issues of female disadvantage and not male disadvantage. So what you are saying, Dennis, for example, that it's not only about girls entering the boys' world, the mask world, you know, doing things, but the opposite, 
but that opposite becomes very difficult because that is perceived as a climb down. Hmm. So when, when a girl becomes a pilot, it's an achievement. But when a boy starts cooking, that's a climb down, or you hmm. start accepting the care work and all that. And that is the challenge of education, that not to let it be seen as, as a climb down. And it would be nice to see how you have uh, you know, approached that. Especially you, because Mudirati, you are working on the ground. Mm -hmm. So that will be nice. And uh, from uh, Mr. Bhatia, the Indian colleague, the, I, I mean, I may have missed, but I have not still understood what the organization works on and how. So okay. a little of that. <laughs> That's a cheeky extra question. <laughs> there, but very good. So, George, that, those were excellent questions. And I think the first one was very much about values, wasn't it? Um, in terms of the kind of feminized domain, care work, uh, and, and so forth, um, if we're to attract uh, more boys and men into these areas, uh, you know, how do we do that? So Denise, I think. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Eu entendo que essa essa construção é uma construção que tem que acontecer conjuntamente entre meninos e meninas. É, é uma construção que pode ser desenvolvida, em, nós trabalhamos assim, em espaços participativos, onde meninas e meninos é, é, discutem a partir de suas histórias de vida, a partir do, seus, do seu cotidiano, como construir é, uma relação mais igualitária. É, e eu acho fundamental a participação das famílias. Nós temos envolvido bastante as famílias para construir junto o que, que significa é, essa transformação no cotidiano, o que significa a divisão do trabalho doméstico para meninos e meninas. Nós sabemos que o trabalho doméstico é desvalorizado socialmente, é, que as, é, o cuidado com crianças é desvalorizado socialmente, como também as políticas sociais que cuidam das pessoas são desvalorizadas socialmente. Então, essa construção é, no cotidiano, é, no nosso caso, envolve muito a relação entre o mundo escolar e as experiências que acontecem para além do mundo escolar nos territórios, é, por meio de coletivos juvenis, grupos culturais, é, movimentos sociais e redes de sociedade civil. Uma experiência que foi muito forte, que até está aqui no, é, no slide que eu trouxe para vocês, é de uma mobilização nacional que aconteceu entre 2015 e 2016 no Brasil, onde é, mais de 200 escolas foram ocupadas por meninos e meninas para defender, é, para questionar os cortes do financiamento na política educacional e uma reforma educacional autoritária imposta pelo governo. Os meninos e meninas, naqueles 200 dias de ocupação, das escolas, onde eles acamparam nas escolas, desenvolveram experiências de convivência muito ricas, onde sentaram, construíram várias rodas de conversa para discutir como cada um se sentia e como poder construir uma relação entre meninos e meninas diferente. Então, eu entendo que o desafio passa muito pela participação, pela escuta e por criar oportunidades onde a gente traga várias referências do que é ser menino e ser menina e que, como podemos construir juntos um trabalho, inclusive, articulado às famílias. Thank you so much. And I think that um, Darwin, we must uh, take the opportunity for you to explain <laughs> who it is you're educating and how. Yeah, so what we do is we run vocational programs focusing only on mathematics and English for girls after school. Mathematics and English programs, which range from like two weeks to six months. And these after school programs that we have partnered with over 400 schools now in Mumbai and about 20 each in uh, the other countries that we are working. And we are not focusing more on history and geography, but to make them more job oriented and skill oriented, we are focusing only on numeracy and language. Thank you very much. Any more questions from the audience? I have to turn myself around to check. <laughs> Lady here, any others? Take them together. So 
But let, please, let's have your question. Yeah. Uh, my question is on these equal opportunities to boys and girls. When our society is so unequal, like how can you address the inequality in the society when uh, don't you think that girls need more than boys to mm. reach with the same level? I need to ask, I want to ask Arman and Munir. I think you also mm. talk about the yes. equal opportunity to boys and girls. Thank you. So that's a really profound challenge then. Do, go, do, do we need sort of compensatory education for girls? That's what you're, yeah. So, Arman. yeah. Thank you very much. So obviously, what truly I mean from this word is like, we need to build champions. We need to build fighters. Like when we look at the girls' education, so obviously we are educating them in such a, educa educating them in such a way, so they will be able to fight the, for their own rights. So obviously we all cannot just continue the work maybe for very last time. Like looking at the challenges that are there, so it needs a larger action, a very collective action. So even by that, by this word, I mean like including the girls themselves. What by equal opportunities I mean is like equal education about equality and respecting each other's rights. If the same thing should be for the boys and for the girls as well. Like the, bo the girls are empowered so that they can fight for themselves, not the men again fighting for them. Like you're educating me so that I can fight for you. Then again, like you're giving me a superior role. So I mean very much equality from the base. Girls empowering them at the same time. Boys as well for them and like equal respect, equal opportunities. And the way you mentioned like the society is not equal itself, but we need to create it. And these are the bases. Education is the base. So from the education of the, we cannot just say like more education, more opportunities for the girls, but then we are allowing the boys. We may have then very good fighters, but maybe at, after 50 years, we'll sit here and we'll discuss about challenges for the boys, like this has increased at this point, <laughs> <laughs> to go side by side. Well, there's something about power, isn't there? Um, and there's something very difficult about asking men and boys to give up power. Um, and when you talk about, you know, girls fighting, um, there's the sort of liberal feminist idea that, you know, g girls' empowerment will enable them to equal men, but a more radical feminist perspective would see men as also having to change so that values look different. Um, Muniratsu, what's your yes. view on this? So, um, when we involve the boys or include them, it's not so much as to um, providing them resources because we still recognize the fact that um, the girls are still somewhere here and the boys are over there. So it is just to let them see themselves as active participants in this process. And also because it's a power issue that we are trying to address, to, to recognize the fact that there's no way you are going to really get girls to this level until the boys really understand that the girls need to be there and also to be able to give off some parts of the power they possess so that the girls would um, be able to have that opportunity. So when we do it, it's so much as to address the power relation and not um, in looking at it from the perspective of, okay, they need equal opportunity. I think still in Ghana, we, we are not there yet. The girls still need a lot of support, but we just recognize the fact that you can only make much progress if you include the boys. Mm. So we run gender role sessions where the girls are very much involved and the boys as well. Sometimes they do basic things like looking at their daily chores before they even come to school in the morning. You realize that most of the girls will end up coming to school late because they have to do a number of activities before they get to school. Whereas the boys would just bath and then off they go to school. So the girls come to school, they're already somehow tired and sleepy in the classroom. So when you go through their roles, then the boys get to recognize that, okay, these are our siblings, these are our siblings, our sisters, our aunties, and then we need to, to be more supportive of them. Look at all the things they need to do before they come. And some of the roles are not roles that men will not be able to do or boys. They can take off some of the roles so that in the morning your sister would also be able to finish on time. Then you go to school together. So when we involve the boys, it's for us to be able to address this and also fasten the pace of progress.
Thank you. And again, you're bringing the importance of the broader family and the community yes. back in again. It's really important. A question here? Uh, any others? And a question at the front. So we'll, we'll take both questions and then uh, have the answers, please. Uh, my name is Silvia. I'm from Brazil. I was wondering if, um, you know, we want, the, we want that gender is in the curriculum of the country. It's like a policy, it's a public policy, right? It's not, uh, in, an, in an ideal world, we want that gender is in education uh, by a government decision, like, like a state policy. But as we don't have it as social, uh, as civil organization, we are working on that. But I'm thinking, what we are doing, what do you, what are you doing mm -hmm. to prepare the teachers to change the gender equality in in schools because gender education and mostly uh, the people in the decision making process in our country they are men they are old mm -hmm. and they don't want to this this kind of change mm -hmm. so what you are doing to prepare the teachers as a key position to change the mind and to, to actually to promote a kind of civilizatory change Thank you. And uh, there was a lady at the front in yellow. My name is Sunita and I'm from India. And this is not a question, but uh, verification and an observation. I think in India, the midday meal scheme is for across the board. It's not only for girls, but across the board. Yeah. It's been there for ages. Correct. My other observation is that when you say the profile of how do you correct these, it's very easy to change the political will. I think the first time uh, in 1966, a plan was made based on very solid evidence that India needs to devote, allocate 6% of the GDP for education. We have had governments after governments from different political parties, and we have not been able to deal 6%. We are still at below 3%. So, how do we deal with that? The political will is very easy to gain. Across the party lines, we haven't been able to reach that target of at least percent they're going down actually. So, wow. I mean, in the education sector, it's very frustrating to see that we have not been able to change the political will, despite the fact that there have been several movements demanding for that, uh, you know, increase in GDP for education for education. Uh, Anita, thank you for that. So that, that, that sounds like a, a grave challenge, and I, I guess it's one for Darvel to answer. Um, and then we'll come back to your excellent question about teacher preparation as well. Darvel. Should I start Please, first? Yeah. yeah. So when I said political will is easy to change was not in percentage of GDP allocation. I said political will is easy to change in terms of getting girls to school. So you know, Prime Minister Modi has launched Beti Padhao, Beti Bachao. It was in that context. We are having girls in school. That was the challenge. And another challenge that we faced in India was it's not about getting girls in school. It is the transit from home to school and schooling to back. Sometimes there is abuse that happens in the school. So we have an act called POXO. It is called Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses. So any girl that is molested by the teacher or by the pune or by the support staff, there are very stringent imprisonment laws and fines that are in place. So that should act as a deterrent to ensure, because many times we have seen parents are not sending girls to school because they feel the environment may not be safe for them. So we have a strict action, uh, strict law in India. It's called POXO, Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses. And is it making a difference? I mean, in relation to the... Uh, the we, uh, we have had, uh, and POXO, we have special courts, fast track courts that ensure that speedy justice is delivered. It has acted as, as a deterrent and we have helpline childline systems. So whenever there is any girl who has faced any abuse or molestation, her identity will be hidden and she can secretly file a report to the police and then they can take it forward. Thank you, it's intriguing. Thank you very much. And then we have this uh, question about teacher training as well and teacher preparation. Amal, you were going to uh, Thank you very much. Uh, actually, just regarding the question you asked, uh, I strongly believe that when we are talking about the policies, so obviously she mentioned that th there may be policies, but then the government will, like all politicians, like men, mostly they don't want. So it all, I, I believe it's, it goes like together, like if we have policies there in the place or not. 
But beside that, when we have policy, policies, do we have strong commitment or not so that it will be implemented? And when we are talking about the commitment, then after that comes the issue of resources. Do we have resources to implement those policies, like for promoting gender equality? And even after that, I mean, I think it, it goes through the process like even when you have resources, then the discussion will come like, do we have public acceptance and how is the mindset of the people for accepting that policy? There have been like lots of policies made. They're, they look very fancy, very good. But at the same time, like in Afghanistan, it happened a lot. Like, then it's not implementable due to the people's mindset at all. Then the question is raised, like, do we make the people's mindset an acceptance to that level, like from the schools, communities, teachers, parents, villages and all? Are they all accepting the policies and the change that we want to bring or not? So it's a long-term action. But also, again, I will come to the same collective several times I mentioned, to that collective effort that will really ensure that we can have all the policies implemented and equality achieved, but if we have that collective action. So it needs commitment at several, many different levels, basically. When you're asking, yes. you so I think, um, as he mentioned, this, this really requires commitment from every level. In, in Ghana, if I can use Ghana again as an example, there's, um, we have some major reforms going on, um, especially at the teacher training level, to ensure that even the way teachers are trained are changed in a way that, that, that is changed in a way that they would come out of school very prepared to be able to teach in the manner that we really expect them to. And at the basic level also, that is also being done, some curriculum reforms to ensure that it's really up to date and really tackles most of these issues that um, we are looking at and also ensure that the two are really aligned because you are not teaching them one thing and then the curriculum that they need to use also says another thing. So that is happening and I think that is very key. In terms of resources, I think, um, well, I, I'm not sure when we are ever going to get to a point where we have um, enough resources. So we would normally try, I think it's important that we try to look at what we can really do within the resource constraints, constraints that we have. And there's always something that can be done at each level. So currently, the reforms are ongoing. But in the classrooms right now, we try to involve the teachers also. For instance, in the projects that we run, because teachers are very key. If you don't get them to really buy into this, mm. and also um, deal with their own stereotypes and mindsets, it becomes difficult for them to, to make you, that change. Yeah. You are, you're developing out with that focus on teachers and what needs to change. Yes. Uh, we've almost come to the end of our time. It's been very stimulating, thank you. Um, I'd really like it if each of you could just finish with what is the key need, one sentence, what is the key need to support, successfully support girls' education? Eu queria só retomar a questão anterior, é, gostaria só de retomar a questão anterior, bem rapidamente, dizer que com relação, com relação ao financiamento, acho que nós temos um desafio de fortalecer alianças para além da educação, mas também com outras áreas sociais. E temos um desafio como educadoras, eh, educadores, de promover a democratização sobre o debate, sobre a economia nas escolas. Esse é um debate ainda muito blindado. Importante que meninas, meninos, professores dominem e discutam as escolhas políticas que estão por trás da economia. E com relação à outra questão que foi abordada, o que nós estamos falando, fazendo com relação aos professores e tal. Nós desenvolvemos uma metodologia de autoavaliação participativa nas escolas eh, que envolve toda a comunidade escolar para discutir como as questões de gênero e raça estão no currículo, estão na valorização dos profissionais, estão nas políticas de permanência, são sete dimensões. Então, essa é uma metodologia de autoavaliação que cria um ambiente de discussão e de formação na escola. Além do que, nós seguimos trabalhando com formação de professores. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So, very quickly, Johan. Yeah, very quickly. I uh, just want to end with, like, when we all look at this, like, who is changing the world? So, if you're removing the word changing, then it comes, like, who is the world? So, if it's about us, if it's about the students, it's about the all people living in it then who is changing it for a better? So obviously I will say those who are providing the platform, opportunities equally to all of us, 
so that we can raise our voice and have like a collective action. So they are the people changing the world, and we all can be that. Be it international donors when we are talking about the funding, governments, and all. Like, <laughs> if it's Thank about you. the people, then obviously a positive response can happen. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. So I think I would say commitments from all stakeholders, from all the various levels, there has to be some level of commitment. Yes. Otherwise, change will not happen. So multifaceted commitment. Yes. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, and I think we need more collaboration between civic society, philanthropic organization, advocacy, and policy makers. You know, any one by itself, we are not islands. We are all connected. So I think uh, I should uh, thank Malala Fund, the Gulmakai Champions, and the GESF for providing a platform today for all of us with this joint intention to take it forward. Thank you. So this thank shared you. commitment is at the heart. Thank you so much, audience, for your participation.